Aerosmith is an American rock band, sometimes referred to as the Bad Boys from Boston and America's greatest rock and roll band. Their style, which is rooted in blues based hard rock, has come to also incorporate elements of pop, heavy metal, and rhythm and blues, and has inspired many subsequent rock artists. They were formed in Boston, Massachusetts in 1970. Guitarist Joe Perry and bassist Tom Hamilton, originally in a band together called the Jam Band, met up with vocalist-slash-pianist-slash-harmonicist Steven Tyler, drummer Joey Kramer, and guitarist Ray Tabano, and formed Aerosmith. In 1971, Tabano was replaced by Brad Whitford, and the band began developing a following in Boston. They were signed to Columbia Records in 1972, and released a string of gold and platinum albums, beginning with their 1973 eponymous debut album, followed by Get Your Wings in 1974. In 1975, the band broke into the mainstream with the album Toys in the Attic, and their 1976 follow-up rocks cemented their status as hard rock superstars. Two additional albums followed in 1977 and 1979. Their first five albums have since attained multi-platinum status. Throughout the 1970s, the band toured extensively and charted a dozen Hot 100 singles. By the end of the decade, they were among the most popular hard rock bands in the world and developed a loyal following of fans, often referred to as the Blue Army. However, drug addiction and internal conflict took their toll on the band, which led to the departures of Perry and Whitford in 1979 and 1981, respectively. They were replaced by Jimmy Crespo and Rick Dufay. The band did not fare well between 1980 and 1984, releasing the album Rock in a Hard Place, which was certified gold but failed to match their previous successes. Perry and Whitford returned to Aerosmith in 1984 and the band signed a new deal with Jeffen Records. After a comeback tour, the band recorded Done with Mirrors, 1985 which won some critical praise but failed to come close to commercial expectations. It was not until the band's collaboration with rap group Run D.M.C in 1986, and the 1987 multi-platinum release Permanent Vacation, that they regained the level of popularity they had experienced in the 1970s. In the late 1980s and 1990s, the band scored several hits and won numerous awards for music from the multi-platinum albums Pump, 1989, Get a Grip, 1993, and Nine Lives, 1997, and embarked on their most extensive concert tours to date. The band also became a pop culture phenomenon with popular music videos and notable appearances in television, film, and video games. Their comeback has been described as one of the most remarkable and spectacular in rock and roll history. Additional albums followed in 2001, 2004 and 2012. Since 2001, the band has toured every year, except 2008. After 47 years of performing, the band continues to tour and record music, but is embarking on a farewell tour that will likely last several years, with the first leg of the tour planned for Europe in the spring and summer of 2017. Aerosmith is the best-selling American hard rock band of all time, having sold more than 150 million records worldwide, including over 70 million records in the United States alone. With 25 gold albums, 18 platinum albums, and 12 multi-platinum albums, they hold the record for the most total certifications by an American band and are tied for the most multi-platinum albums by an American band. The band has scored 21 top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100, 9 number 1 mainstream rock hits, four Grammy Awards, six American Music Awards, and ten MTV Video Music Awards. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001, and were included among both Rolling Stones and VH1's lists of the 100 Greatest Artists of All Time. In 2013, the band's principal songwriters, Tyler and Perry, were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. History Formation 1964-1971. In 1964, Steven Tyler formed his own band called the Strang Ewers Later Chain Reaction in New Hampshire. Meanwhile, Perry and Hamilton formed the Jam Band, 
commonly known as Joe Perry's Jam Band, which was based on free form and blues. Hamilton and Perry moved to Boston, Massachusetts in September 1969. There they met Joey Kramer, a drummer from Yonkers, New York. Kramer knew Tyler and had always hoped to play in a band with him. Kramer, a Berkeley College of Music student, decided to quit school to join Jam Band. In 1970, Chain Reaction and Jam Band played at the same gig. Tyler immediately loved Jam Band's sound, and wanted to combine the two bands. In October 1970, the bands met up again and considered the proposition. Tyler, who had been a drummer and backup singer in Chain Reaction, adamantly refused to play drums in this new band insisting he would only take part if he could be frontman and lead vocalist. The others agreed, and a new band was born. The band moved into a home together at 1325 Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, where they wrote and rehearsed music together and relaxed in between shows. The members of the band reportedly spent afternoons getting stoned and watching Three Stooges reruns. One day, they had a post-Stooges meeting to try to come up with a name. Kramer said when he was in school he would write the word Aerosmith all over his notebooks. The name had popped into his head after listening to Harry Nilsson's album Aerial Ballet, which featured jacket art of a circus performer jumping out of a biplane. Initially, Kramer's bandmates were unimpressed, they all thought he was referring to the Sinclair Lewis novel they were required to read in high school English class. No, not Aerosmith, Kramer explained. A-E-R-O, Aerosmith. The band settled upon this name after also considering the Hookers and Spike Jones. Soon, the band hired Ray Tabano, a childhood friend of Tyler, as rhythm guitarist and began playing local shows. Aerosmith played their first gig in Menden, Massachusetts at Nipmuc Regional High School, now Misco Hill Middle School, on November 6, 1970. In 1971, Tabano was replaced by Brad Whitford who also attended the Berklee School of Music and was formerly of the band Earth Incorporated Whitford, from Reading, Massachusetts, had already played at Reading's Coolidge Middle School. Other than a period from July 1979 to April 1984, the lineup of Tyler, Perry, Hamilton, Kramer and Whitford has stayed the same. Record Deal, Aerosmith, Get Your Wings and Toys in the Attic, 1971-1975 after forming the band and finalizing the lineup in 1971, the band started to garner some local success doing live shows. Originally booked through the Ed Malhoyt Agency, the band signed a promotion deal with Frank Connolly and eventually secured a management deal with David Krebs and Steve Labor in 1972. Krebs and Labor invited Columbia Records president Clive Davis to see the band at Max's Kansas City in New York City. Aerosmith was not originally scheduled to play that night at the club, but they paid from their own pockets to secure a place on the bill, reportedly the only band ever to do so at Max's. No surprise from their Night in the Ruts album celebrates the moment their fame began. Aerosmith signed with Columbia in mid-1972 for a reported $125,000 and issued their debut album, Aerosmith. Released in January 1973, the album peaked at number 166. The album was straightforward rock and roll with well defined blues influences, laying the groundwork for Aerosmith's signature blues rock sound. Although the highest charting single from the album was Dream On at number 59, several tracks, such as Mama Kin and Walkin' the Dog, would become staples of the band's live shows and receive airplay on rock radio. The album reached gold status initially, eventually went on to sell 2 million copies and was certified double platinum after the band reached mainstream success over a decade later. After constant touring, the band released their second album Get Your Wings in 1974, the first of a string of multi-platinum albums produced by Jack Douglas. This album included the rock radio hits Same Old Song and Dance and Train Kept A Rollin', a cover done previously by the Yardbirds. The album also contained several fan favorites including Lord of the Thighs, Seasons of Wither, and S.O.S., Too Bad, darker songs which have become staples in the band's live shows. To date, Get Your Wings has sold 3 million copies.
It was 1975's Toys in the Attic, however, that established Aerosmith as international stars competing with the likes of Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones. Originally derided as Rolling Stones knockoffs in part due to the physical resemblance between lead singers Steven Tyler and Mick Jagger, Toys in the Attic showed that Aerosmith was a unique and talented band in their own right. Toys in the Attic was an immediate success, starting with the single Sweet Emotion, which became the band's first top 40 hit. This was followed by a successful re-release of Dream On which hit number 6, becoming their best charting single of the 1970s. Walk This Way, re-released in 1976, reached the top 10 in early 1977. In addition, Toys in the Attic and Big 10-inch Record, a song originally recorded by Bull Moose Jackson, became concert staples. As a result of this success, both of the band's previous albums recharted. Toys in the Attic has gone on to become the band's best-selling studio album in the States, with certified U.S. sales of 8 million copies. The band toured in support of Toys in the Attic, where they started to get more recognition. Also around this time, the band established their home base as the warehouse in Waltham, Massachusetts, where they would record and rehearse music, as well as conduct business. Rocks, Draw the Line and Live Bootleg 1976-1978 Aerosmith's next album was 1970's IXS Rocks, which captured Aerosmith at their most raw and rocking. It went platinum Swift Lion featured two FM hits, Last Child and Back in the Saddle, as well as the ballad Home Tonight, which also charted Rocks has sold 4 million copies to date. Both Toys in the Attic and Rocks are highly regarded specially in the hard rock genre, and appear on such lists as Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time, and are cited by members of Guns N' Roses, Metallica and Motley Crue as having large influences on their music. Kurt Cobain listed Rocks as one of the albums he thought were most influential to Nirvana's sound in his journal in 1993. Soon after Rocks was released, the band continued to tour heavily, this time headlining their own shows and playing to several large stadiums and rock festivals. Aerosmith's next album was 1977's Draw the Line. The album's recording was affected by the excesses of the band members, but the record still had memorable moments. The title track charted just shy of the top 40 and remains a live staple, and Kings and Queens also charted. The album went on to sell 2 million copies. The band toured extensively in support of the album, however, drug abuse and the fast paced life of touring and recording began affecting their performances. Lead singer Steven Tyler and lead guitarist Joe Perry became known as the Toxic Twins because of their notorious abuse of drugs on and off the stage. Heil continuing to tour and record into the late 1970s, Aerosmith acted in the movie version of SGT Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Their cover of the Beatles' hit Come Together was included in the album's soundtrack and would be the band's last top 40 hit for nearly 10 years. The live release Live. Bootleg, originally released as a double album, was put out in 1978 and captured the band's rawness during the heyday of the Draw the Line tour. The standalone single Chip Away the Stone was also released in 1978 and charted at number 77. Departures of Perry and Whitford, Night in the Ruts and Rock in a Hard Place, 1979-1984 In 1979, the band started work on their next album, Night in the Ruts. Aerosmith decided to go on tour during a break in the recording schedule but tensions within the band were slowly coming to a head. The band's touring schedule brought them to Cleveland Stadium on July 28, 1979, where they headlined the World Series of Rock Festival. In a heated argument backstage, Joe Perry's wife, Elissa, threw a glass of milk at Tom Hamilton's wife, Terry. Following the show, Tyler and Perry got into a heated argument when Tyler confronted Perry about his wife's antics, and after the course of the argument Perry quit the band and left, while Tyler claims in his autobiography that he fired Perry from the band. In leaving, Perry took some of the music that he had written with him. Shortly after his departure Perry formed a new band called the Joe Perry Project. Since there was still work to be done on Night in the Ruts, Aerosmith needed fill-in musicians to take Perry's place on the songs that needed to be recorded to complete the album. 
Rhythm guitarist Brad Whitford took over some of the lead parts and Richie Supa, the band's longtime writing partner, filled in where needed until the band was able to hire Jimmy Crespo to take over as the full-time guitarist. Night in the Ruts was released in November 1979, but only managed to sell enough records to be certified gold at the time, it would eventually sell enough to be platinum certified in 1994. The only single the album spawned, a cover of Remember, Walking in the Sand, by the Shangri-Las, peaked at number 67 on the Billboard Hot 100. The tour for Night in the Ruts commenced shortly thereafter but the band found themselves playing in smaller and smaller venues than they were before due to their popularity beginning to wane. Steven Tyler's drug issues were starting to affect his performance and songwriter, and he reached bottom when he collapsed on stage during a show in Portland, Maine in 1980 and did not get up for the remainder of the set. Also in 1980, Aerosmith released its greatest hits album. While the compilation didn't chart very high initially, it gained popularity later and has gone on to become the band's best-selling album in the United States, with sales of 11 million copies. In the fall of 1980, Tyler was injured in a serious motorcycle accident, which left him hospitalized for two months, and unable to tour or record well into 1981. In 1981, Aerosmith began work on their next album, which was titled Rock in a Hard Place and saw them reunite with producer Jack Douglas. Once again, though, they would be forced to deal with another departure. After the first song for the album, Lightning Strikes, was recorded Brad Whitford departed the band and decided to form a duo with Derek St. Holmes, with whom he recorded a self-titled album that failed to garner much interest. Whitford later joined up with the Joe Perry Project and played with them in 1984. With Rick Dufay taking Whitford's place, Rock in a Hard Place was released on August 1, 1982. The album reached number 32 on the Billboard 200 album chart. Only one single charted, the aforementioned Lightning Strikes, which peaked at number 21 on the Billboard Top Tracks chart. As with the tour for Night in the Ruts, Aerosmith was unable to book larger venues and instead had to rely on filling clubs and theaters, which they struggled to do. At a show in Worcester, Massachusetts, Tyler and Perry reunited and got high backstage before the show. Tyler was so intoxicated that he collapsed on stage again and, like before, could not get up. On February 14, 1984, Perry and Whitford saw Aerosmith perform at Boston's Orpheum Theater. Shortly thereafter, discussions began to reintegrate the two into the band and several months later, the original members of Aerosmith reunited. Steven Tyler recalls. Back in the Saddle reunion tour, Done with Mirrors and Drug Rehab, 1984-1986. In 1984, Aerosmith embarked on a reunion tour called the Back in the Saddle Tour which led to the live album Classics Live 2. While concerts on the tour were well attended, it was plagued with several incidents, mostly attributed to drug abuse by band members. Their problems still not behind them. The group was signed to Jeffen Records and began working on a comeback. Despite the band signing on to a new record company, the band's old label Columbia continued to reap the benefits of Aerosmith's comeback, releasing the live companion albums Classics Live 1 and 2 and the collection Gems. In 1985, the band released the album Done with Mirrors, their first studio album since reuniting. While the album did receive some positive reviews, it only went gold and failed to produce a hit single or generate any widespread interest. The album's most notable track, Let the Music Do the Talking, was in fact a cover of a song originally recorded by the Joe Perry Project and released on that band's album of the same name. Nevertheless, the band became a popular concert attraction once again, touring in support of Done With Mirrors, well into 1986. In 1986, Tyler and Perry appeared on Run D.M.C.'s cover of Walk This Way, a track blending rock and roll with hip hop. In reaching number 4 on the Billboard Hot 100, the song and its frequently aired video confirmed rap's mainstream appeal and resurrected Aerosmith's career by introducing the band's music to a new generation. Yet the band members' drug problems still stood in their way. In 1986, Tyler completed a successful drug rehabilitation program. After an intervention by his fellow band members, a doctor and manager Tim Collins, 
who believed that the band's future would not be bright if Tyler did not get treated. The rest of the band members also completed drug rehab programs over the course of the next couple of years. According to the band's tell-all autobiography, Collins pledged in September 1986 he could make Aerosmith the biggest band in the world by 1990 if they all completed drug rehab. Their next album was crucial because of the commercial disappointment of Done With Mirrors, and as the band members became clean, they worked hard to make their next album a success. Permanent Vacation and Pump, 1987-1991 Permanent Vacation was released in September 1987, becoming a major hit and the band's best-selling album in over a decade, selling 5 million copies in the US, with all three of its singles, Dude, Looks Like a Lady, Rag Doll, and Angel, reaching the top 20 of the Billboard Hot 100. Steven Tyler reveals in his autobiography that the album was, the first one we ever did sober. Part of Permanent Vacation's commercial success involved producer Bruce Fairbairn whose production touches, such as sound effects and high-quality recording, added interest to the album and the use of outside songwriters such as Desmond Child, Jim Valance, and Holly Knight who assisted the band with lyrics. While the group was initially hesitant to using outside songwriters, including Tyler being furious for Knight getting songwriter credits for changing one word, Ragtime became Ragdoll, the method paid off, as Permanent Vacation became the band's most successful album in a decade. The group went on a subsequent tour with label mates Guns N' Roses, who have cited Aerosmith as a major influence, which was intense at times because of Aerosmith's new struggle to stay clean amidst Guns N' Roses' well-publicized, rampant drug use. Aerosmith's next album was even more successful. Pump, released in September 1989, featured three top ten singles, what It Takes, Janie's Got a Gun, and Love in an Elevator, as well as the Top 30 The Other Side re-establishing the band as a serious musical force. Pump was a critical and commercial success, eventually selling 7 million copies spawning several music videos that were in regular rotation on MTV, and achieving four-star ratings from major music magazines. Pump ranked as the fourth best-selling album of 1990. The band also won its first Grammy in the category of Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal, for Janie's Got a Gun. In addition, the video for Janie's Got a Gun won two video music awards and was ranked as one of the 100 greatest videos of all time by Rolling Stone, MTV, and VH1. Like Permanent Vacation, Pump was produced by Bruce Fairbairn who added production touches such as instrumental interludes that provided transitions between songs to give the album a more complete sound, as well as the Margarita Horns, who added horns to tracks such as Love in an Elevator and The Other Side. Rock critic Stephen Thomas Erlewine claimed that Pump revels in pop concessions without ever losing sight of Aerosmith's dirty hard rock core, going on to say that, such ambition and successful musical eclectism make Pump rank with Toys in the Attic and Rocks. The recording process for Pump was documented in the video The Making of Pump, which has since been re released as a DVD. The music videos for the album's singles were featured on the release Things That Go Pump in the Night, which quickly went platinum. In support of Pump, the band embarked on the 12 month Pump tour, which lasted for most of 1990. On February 21, 1990, the band appeared in A. Wayne's World sketch on Saturday Night Live, debating the fall of communism and the Soviet Union, and performed their recent hits Janie's Got a Gun and Monkey on My Back. The appearance of the band in the Wayne's World sketch was later ranked by E. as the number one moment in the history of the program. On August 11, 1990, the band's performance on MTV's Unplugged aired. In October 1990, the Pump Tour ended, with the band's first ever performances in Australia. That same year, the band was also inducted to the Hollywood Rock Walk. In November 1991, the band appeared on The Simpsons episode Flaming Moe's and released a box set titled Pandora's Box. In coordination with the release of Pandora's Box, the band's 1975 hit Sweet Emotion was remixed and re-released as a single, and a music video was created to promote the single. Also in 1991, 
the band performed their 1973 single Dream On with Michael Kamen's orchestra for MTV's 10th anniversary special, this performance was used as the official music video for the song. In 1992, Tyler and Perry appeared live as guests of Guns N' Roses during the latter's 1992 worldwide pay-per-view show in Paris, performing a medley of Mamakin, which GNR covered in 1986, and Train Kept A Rollin. Get a Grip and Big Ones, 1992-1995 The band took a brief break before recording their follow-up to Pump in 1992. Despite significant shifts in mainstream music at the beginning of the 1990s 1993s Get a Grip was just as successful commercially, becoming their first album to debut at number one and racking up sales of 7 million copies in a two and a half year time span. The first singles were The Hard Rocking Livin' on the Edge and Eat the Rich. Though many critics were unimpressed by the focus on the subsequent interchangeable power ballads in promoting the album all three, Cryin', Crazy and Amazing, proved to be huge successes on radio and MTV. The music videos featured then up and coming actress Alicia Silverstone. Her provocative performances earned her the title of the Aerosmith chick for the first half of the decade. Steven Tyler's daughter Liv Tyler was also featured in the crazy video. Get a Grip would go on to sell more than 7 million copies in the US alone and over 20 million copies worldwide. The band won two Grammy Awards for songs from this album in the category of Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal, for Livin' on the Edge in 1994 and Crazy in 1995. During the making of Get a Grip, the management and record company brought in a variety of professional songwriter collaborators to help give nearly all the songs on the album more commercial appeal a trend which would continue until the early 2000s. However, this led to accusations of selling out that would continue throughout the 1990s. In addition to Aerosmith's grueling 18-month world tour in support of Get a Grip, the band also did a number of things to help promote themselves and their album and appeal to youth culture, including the appearance of the band in the movie Wayne's World 2 where they performed two songs, the appearance of the band and their music in the video games Revolution X and Quest for Fame, performing at Woodstock 94, using their song Deuces Are Wild in the Beavis and Butthead. Experience, and opening their own club, the Mama Kin Music Hall, in Boston, Ma in 1994. That same year saw the release of the band's compilation for Jeffen Records, entitled Big Ones featuring their biggest hits from Permanent Vacation, Pump, and Get a Grip, Deuces Are Wild from the Beavis and Butthead Experience, as well as two new songs, Blind Man and Walk on Water, both of which experienced great success on the rock charts. Nine Lives and I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, 1996-2000 Aerosmith had signed a $30 million contract for four records with Columbia Records slash Sony Music in 1991, but had only recorded three of their six contractual albums with Jeffen Records at that point, Done With Mirrors, Permanent Vacation, and Pump. Between 1991 and 1996, they released two more albums with Jeffen, Get a Grip and Big Ones, which meant they now had five albums with Jeffen under their belt, along with a planned live compilation, which meant they could now begin recording for their new contract with Columbia. The band took time off with their families before working on their next album, Nine Lives, which was plagued with personnel problems, including the firing of manager Tim Collins, who, according to band members, had nearly caused the band to break up. The album's producer was also changed from Glenn Ballard to Kevin Shirley. Nine Lives was released in March 1997. Reviews were mixed, and Nine Lives initially fell down the charts although it had a long chart life and sold double platinum in the United States alone fueled by its singles, Falling in Love, Is Hard on the Knees, The Ballad Hole in My Soul, and the crossover pop smash Pink which won the band their fourth Grammy Award in 1999 in the Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal category, dot it was followed by the over two-year-long Nine Lives tour, which was plagued by problems. Including lead singer Steven Tyler injuring his leg at a concert, and Joey Kramer suffering second-degree burns when his car caught fire at a gas station. In 1998, in the midst of setbacks during the Nine Lives tour, the band released the single I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, the love theme, 
written by Diane Warren for the 1998 film Armageddon, starring Steven Tyler's daughter Liv. The song became Aerosmith's first and only number one single when it debuted at the top position on the Billboard Hot 100 and stayed on top of the charts for four weeks. The song was nominated for an Academy Award in 1999. The song helped open Aerosmith up to a new generation and remains a slow dance staple. 1998 also saw the release of the Double Live album, A Little South of Sanity, which was assembled from performances on the Get a Grip and Nine Lives tours. The album went platinum shortly after its release. The band continued with their seemingly never ending world tours promoting Nine Lives and the I Don't Want to Miss a Thing single well into 1999. In 1999, Aerosmith was featured in the Disney Hollywood Studios at Walt Disney World, and later in 2001 at Disneyland Paris in the Walt Disney Studios Park, Ride, Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith, providing the ride's soundtrack and theme. On September 9, 1999, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry reunited with Rundi.m.c and were also joined by Kid Rock for a collaborative live performance of Walk This Way at the MTV Video Music Awards a precursor to the Girls of Summer Tour. The band celebrated the new millennium with a brief tour of Japan, and also contributed the song Angel's Eye to the 2000 film Charlie's Angels. In December 2000, they wrapped up work on their next album. Just Push Play, Oh, Yeah, and Roximus Maximus, 2001-2003. The band entered their next decade by performing at the halftime show for Super Bowl 35 in January 2001, along with pop stars NSYNC, Britney Spears, Mary J. Bleach, and Nelly. All of the stars collaborated with Aerosmith at the end for a performance of Walk This Way. In March 2001, the band released their 13th studio album Just Push Play which quickly went platinum fueled by the top 10 single Jaded and the appearance of the title track in Dodge commercials. They were inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame soon after their album was released, in late March 2001. Aerosmith is the only band to be inducted to the Hall of Fame with a song active in the charts, Jaded. Later that year, the band performed as part of the United We Stand. What More Can I Give Benefit concert in Washington, D.C. for 9-11's victims and their families. The band flew back to Indianapolis for a show the same night, as part of their Just Push Play tour. The band started 2002 by ending the Just Push Play tour, and simultaneously recording segments for their Behind the Music special on VH1, which not only chronicled the band's history but also the band's current activities and touring. The special was one of the few behind the musics to run two hours in length. In May, Aerosmith covered the theme from Spider-Man for the soundtrack of the 2002 film of the same name. On June 27, the band performed at the official FIFA World Cup concert at Tokyo Stadium which took place during the 2002 FIFA World Cup held in Japan-slash-Korea. In July 2002, Aerosmith released a two-disc career-spanning compilation Oh, Yet. Yeah, Ultimate Aerosmith Hits, which featured the new single Girls of Summer and embarked on the Girls of Summer tour with Kid Rock and Run D.M.C opening. Oh, yeah, has since been certified double platinum. MTV honored Aerosmith with their MTV ICON Award in 2002. Performances included Pink covering Janie's Got a Gun. Shakira performed Dude, Looks Like a Lady, Kid Rock played Mama Kin and Last Child. Train performed Dream On and Papa Roach covered Sweet Emotion. In addition, testimonials featured surprise guests Metallica, as well as Janet Jackson, Limp Bizkit singer Fred Durst, Alicia Silverstone, and Mila Kunis. In 2003, Aerosmith CEO headlined with Kiss on the Roximus Maximus tour, in preparation for release of their blues album. They also performed a song for Rugrats Go Wild, Lizard Love. Honkin' on Bobo, Rockin' the Joint and Devil's Got a New Disguise, 2004-2006 Aerosmith's long-promised blues album Honkin' on Bobo was released in 2004. This was a return to the band's roots, including recording the album in live sessions, working with former producer Jack Douglas, and laying down their blues rock grit. It was followed by a live DVD, You Gotta Move, 
in December 2004 culled from performances on the Honkin on Bobo tour. Dream On was also featured in an advertising campaign for Buick in 2004, targeting that Mark's market which is now composed largely of people who were teenagers when the song first charted. 2005 saw Steven Tyler appear in the film Be Cool. Joe Perry released his self-titled solo album that same year. At the 2006 Grammy Awards, he was nominated for Best Rock Instrumental Performance for the track Mercy, but lost to Lay Paul. In October 2005, Aerosmith released a CD-slash-DVD Rockin' The Joint. The band hit the road for the Rockin' The Joint tour on October 30 with Lenny Kravitz for a fall-slash-winter tour of arenas in the largest U.S. markets. The band planned to tour with Cheap Trick in the spring, hitting secondary markets in the U.S. Almost all of this leg of the tour was cancelled, however. Dates were initially cancelled one by one until March 22, 2006 when it was announced that lead singer Steven Tyler needed throat surgery, and the remaining dates on the tour were subsequently cancelled. Aerosmith commenced recording a new album on Armed Forces Day 2006. Tyler and Perry performed with the Boston Pops Orchestra for their annual July 4 concert on the Esplanade in 2006, a milestone as it was the first major event or performance since Steven Tyler's throat surgery. Around this time, the band also announced that they would embark on the Root of All Evil tour with Motley Crue in late 2006. On August 24, 2006 it was announced that Tom Hamilton was undergoing treatment for throat cancer. In order to make a full recovery, he set out much of the Root of All Evil tour until he was well again. Former Joe Perry Project bassist David Hull substituted for Hamilton until his return. On September 5, 2006, Aerosmith kicked off the Root of All Evil tour with Motley Crue in Columbus, Ohio. The CO headlining tour took both bands to amphitheaters across North America through November 24. After that, a select few arena dates were added, some of which were with Motley Crue. The tour ended December 17. On October 17, 2006, the compilation album Devils Got a New Disguise, The Very Best of Aerosmith was released. The album contained previous hits with the addition of two new songs, Devil's Got a New Disguise and Sedona Sunrise, which were older outtakes re-recorded for the album. Devil's Got a New Disguise peaked at number 15 on the mainstream rock tracks chart. The album was intended to fulfill Aerosmith's contract with Sony and tied fans over until the band's new studio album was released. Touring, Guitar Hero, Aerosmith and Unfinished Album, 2007-2009 in early 2007, the band announced a new world tour, their first for nearly a decade to include dates outside North America or Japan. The band performed at London's Hard Rock Cafe in February 2007 to promote their European tour which included a night in Hyde Park as part of the Hyde Park Calling Festival sponsored by Hard Rock Cafe. In the spring, the band toured Latin America to sold-out stadium crowds. In the summer, the band toured Europe performing at several major rock festivals and visiting some countries they had never played before. Additionally, the band played in Middle East countries such as the United Arab Emirates and India for the first time. The band also played a few select dates in California and Canada in late July. One such date, a July 21st concert in Prince Edward Island, was the largest in that province's history. In September, the band performed eight dates in major markets in northeastern North America. These shows were opened by Joan Jett. The band also played a private gig in Hawaii. A public show in Maui was cancelled for logistical reasons, which spurred a class action lawsuit against the band. In April 2009, Aerosmith agreed to compensate all ticket buyers of the cancelled show with a free ticket to a rescheduled Maui show to be held on October 20, 2009 along with reimbursements of all out-of-pocket expenses related to the show. On November 1, 2007, the band entered the studio to work on the final studio album of their current contract with Sony. At the time, it was believed that the album would include both re-recorded tracks left off previous albums as well as brand new material. In an interview, guitarist Joe Perry revealed that in addition to creating a new album, 
the band was working closely with the makers of the Guitar Hero series to develop Guitar Hero, Aerosmith, a video game dedicated to the band's music. The game was released on June 29, 2008 and contains many of their most popular songs. Steven Tyler announced on VH1 Classic Radio on September 4, 2008 that Aerosmith intends to enter the studio at the end of September 2008 to complete the band's 15th studio album. Tyler also confirmed that the band plans to begin a new U.S. tour in June 2009, in support of the as-yet-untitled album. This tour was supposed to be preceded by a concert in Venezuela on February 1, 2009. However, on January 15, 2009, Tyler said the band would be unable to play the gig because of a second knee injury of guitarist Joe Perry. In mid-February 2009, it was announced that the album would be produced by the famed Brendan O'Brien and that the album would likely be recorded live, like their earlier records. Although the band had hoped to finish the album before the tour started in June 2009, Perry said that the group realized there wasn't any chance of getting the album finished before we hit the road for the summer. The tour featured ZZ Top as the opening act for most of the tour. The Aerosmith slash ZZ Top tour, presented by Guitar Hero, Aerosmith, was officially announced and the first dates released on April 8, 2009. The tour was slated to take the band across North America from June to September 2009. The tour featured the band perform nearly all of the songs on the band's 1975 album Toys in the Attic during the first seven dates of the tour and also featured Joe Perry sing lead vocals on the 1976 deep cut combination. The tour was plagued with several health problems, however. Guitarist Brad Whitford had to sit out the first seven dates of the tour in order to recover from head surgery, after injuring his head getting out of his car. On June 28, 2009, at the band's seventh show of the tour at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut, lead singer Steven Tyler injured his leg, which required seven shows to be postponed. As soon as the band resumed the tour on July 15, Whitford returned to the fold. However, Tom Hamilton had to depart the tour in order to recover from non-invasive surgery. On August 5, 2009, Tyler was rushed to the hospital after falling from the stage at a concert in Sturgis, South Dakota. He was helped up by security staff and taken backstage, before guitarist Joe Perry told the audience the show was over. Tyler was airlifted to Rapid City Regional Hospital, where he received treatment for head and neck injuries and a broken shoulder. In the wake of Tyler's injuries, the band was forced to postpone five shows in Western Canada. On August 14, 2009, Aerosmith announced that they had decided to cancel the rest of their U.S. tour dates with ZZ Top, due to Tyler's injuries. In the midst of the tour, Perry completed work on his fifth solo album, Have Guitar, Will Travel, and drummer Joey Kramer released his autobiography, Hit Hard. Perry's solo album was released on October 6, 2009. After Tyler recovered from falling off stage, the band returned to the stage in mid-October for two shows in Hawaii, one in Maui which was rescheduled from 2007 and finally played as part of a legal settlement, and an additional show which was played in Honolulu. In early November, the band played a concert in Abu Dhabi at the Grand Prix. Tyler Perry feud and cocked, locked and ready to rock tour, 2009-2010. Tyler pulled out of a planned South American tour at the end of 2009 and seemed intent on pursuing solo projects, including his autobiography Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? Tyler told Classic Rock Magazine, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but it's definitely going to be something Steven Tyler, working on the brand of myself brand Tyler. Meanwhile, guitarist Joe Perry toured the United States at the end of 2009, and Japan and the UK early in 2010. In November 2009, Joe Perry stated that Tyler had not been in contact with the band and could be on the verge of quitting Aerosmith. Perry stated that the rest of the group was looking for a new singer to work with. It was reported that singer Lenny Kravitz had been approached for Steven Tyler's position, which he then declined. However, despite the rumors of him leaving the band, 
Tyler joined the Joe Perry Project on stage on November 10, 2009 at the Fillmore New York at Irving Plaza, and Tyler and Perry performed the Aerosmith single Walk This Way together. According to sources at the event, Tyler assured the crowd that he was not quitting Aerosmith. On December 22, People magazine reported that Tyler had entered a rehabilitation facility to manage his addiction to painkillers, brought on by injuries to his knees, legs, and feet, that resulted from years of performing. In his statement, Tyler said he is grateful for the support he is receiving, is committed to getting things taken care of, and is eager to get back on stage and in the recording studio with his bandmates. On January 20, 2010, Perry confirmed the band were about to audition for a new singer to replace Tyler. Perry said Tyler's surgery to his legs would take him out of the picture for up to a year and a half, and in the meantime, the rest of the band wanted to continue performing. Perry also said that the band would be willing to continue working with Tyler in the future if the singer wanted to. In response, Tyler's attorney sent the band and its manager a cease and desist letter and threatened further legal action against both if the band did not discontinue this effort to replace Tyler. On February 15, 2010, it was announced that Aerosmith were to headline Download Festival at Dunnington Park, England in June 2010. Tyler was confirmed as the frontman for the show by festival promoter Andy Copping. It was announced that the band would precede the June 13 date with an appearance at the Sweden Rock Festival on June 10 in Salvesborg. During the Dunnington show, Perry celebrated Tyler's position as frontman, dubbing him the best lead singer on the planet. On February 24, the band announced the first batch of dates for their upcoming Cocked, Locked, Ready to Rock tour. The tour saw the band play seven dates in South and Central America in May followed by 11 dates in Europe, in June, and early July. The band performed in Colombia, Peru, and Greece for the first time in their career on this tour. The band performed 24 concerts in North America in late July, August, and September. Many of the concerts were in locations the band cancelled on in 2009. As part of the tour, the band played Fenway Park in Boston with fellow Bostonians the J. Giles Band. Problems on the band's cocked, locked, and ready-to-rock tour arose in August 2010, including Tyler accidentally hitting Joe Perry in the head with his microphone stand at a show in Wanta, New York, and Perry bumping into Tyler at the Toronto show, which caused Tyler to tumble off the stage. Perry suffered a minor head injury at the Wanta show and Tyler was helped back up by fans and Perry at the Toronto show, and both shows went on. Around the same time as these incidents, Tension flared again between Perry and Tyler due to Tyler's plans to become a talent judge on American Idol. Perry criticized Tyler for not consulting the rest of the band, saying that he found out on the internet, like the rest of the world and that nobody else in the band knew anything about it. On August 18, it was reported that Tyler officially signed on with the show. When asked about this in October, Perry declared he understood Tyler's reasons and wished him luck but stated that he would seek different projects I'm tired of waiting around, so I'm not passing up anything right now. While announcing the cocked, locked, and ready to rock tour in 2009, Tyler and Perry said that the next item on the agenda was a new Aerosmith album, the group's first since 2004's Honkin on Bobo the group did some recording with producer Brendan O'Brien in 2008 but halted because of Tyler's health problems. Aerosmith bassist Tom Hamilton told the Boston Herald in September 2010 that Tyler believes he has the time and energy to continue fronting the band while also being a judge on American Idol. Hamilton explained, Stevens been very emphatic in saying that the way his time is arranged on the show leaves room to work on a record. He's been taking great pains to remind everybody of that, so hopefully that's the way it will come out. On November 5, 2010, Brad Whitford said the recording sessions will probably be in Los Angeles, where American Idol is headquartered, and a world tour would follow. Touring and Music from Another Dimension 2010-2013 In a November 2010 interview reported at NME.com, drummer Joey Kramer confirmed that the band had every intention to finish and release their long-delayed album in 2011, stating, Really, at this point in time, 
the only thing that's going to stop us is if someone out and out dies. Other than that, we've already been through what we've been through and stood the test of time. What else is there? On January 18, 2011, Tyler declared that Joe, Perry, has got some licks and I've got a bunch of songs that I've written for Solo and Slash or Aerosmith and the band would start prepping the album that week. On March 20, 2011, Aerosmith announced a new greatest hits album, Tough Love, Best of the Ballads, which was released on May 10, 2011. On May 14, 2011, the band announced a tour of Latin America in the fall of 2011. In June, Joe Perry announced that the band is going to meet at the recording studio to produce the next album of the band in July. On August 30th, it was announced that the new album will be released around May 2012. The album will be produced by Jack Douglas, who produced four albums for the band in the 1970s. Aerosmith began their fall tour of Latin America and Japan on October 22 in Lima, Peru. As part of the tour, the band performed in Paraguay, Panama and Ecuador for the first time in their careers. Their show in Asuncion, Paraguay was postponed a day, after lead singer Steven Tyler sustained facial injuries after falling in his hotel room shower, due to a bout of food poisoning that dehydrated him and caused him to faint. On March 11, 2012, Aerosmith was featured on an episode of 60 Minutes. The show included very candid interviews with the band members, interspersed with live performances from the band's 2011 tour. Some of the comments the band members said about each other seemed to reignite past tensions in the band. However, on March 22, Joe Perry surprised Steven Tyler by performing Happy Birthday for him on American Idol, as an early birthday present for Tyler. On March 26, Aerosmith announced a summer tour with Cheap Trick entitled The Global Warming Tour. On May 23, Aerosmith debuted their new single, Legendary Child, on the season finale of American Idol. Shortly after, it was announced that their 15th studio album, Music from Another Dimension, would be released on November 6, 2012. On May 30, Aerosmith and Cheap Trick performed for Walmart shareholders. Aerosmith's global warming tour began June 16 in Minneapolis and took the band to 26 locations across North America through August 12. The band hinted that the tour would continue in October-November after the album release. On August 22, Aerosmith released two singles simultaneously, The Rocker A Lover A Lot and The Ballad What Could Have Been Love. On September 22, Aerosmith performed at the iHeartRadio Music Festival in Las Vegas. In advance of the release of their new album, the band performed on The Late Show with David Letterman and Today, and Tyler and Perry were interviewed on The Late Show and The View. In addition, Tyler, Perry and Whitford performed Dream On for the telethon Hurricane Sandy, coming together to raise funds for the victims of the namesake storm that struck the northeastern United States. On November 5th, Aerosmith performed an outdoor concert in front of their old apartment at 1325 Commonwealth Avenue in Boston to celebrate the release of their album and their Boston roots. Music from Another Dimension, was released on November 6. Two days later, the band began the second leg of their global warming tour, which took the band to 14 North American locations through December 13. On January 21, 2013, Aerosmith released Can't Stop Lovin' You, featuring Carrie Underwood, as the fourth single from Music from Another Dimension. On February 20, it was announced that the band's principal songwriters Steven Tyler and Joe Perry would be recipients of the ASCAP Founders Award at the Society's 30th Annual Pop Music Awards on April 17. Two days later, it was announced that the duo would be inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame at a ceremony to be held on June 13. In late April and early May 2013, Aerosmith extended their global warming tour to Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore. This marked the band's first performances in Australia in 23 years, and the band's first ever performances in the latter four countries. Tom Hamilton had to miss the last three Australian shows due to illness, David Hull filled in for him. On May 5, 
Aerosmith cancelled their first ever performance in Indonesia, scheduled for May 11, due to safety concerns, the actual threat was not released. On May 30, Aerosmith performed as part of the Boston Strong Charity Concert for victims of the Boston Marathon bombings. The band also performed at the Greenbrier Classic in West Virginia on July 6, at the Foxwoods Resort Casino in Connecticut on July 10, four concerts in Japan in mid-August, and as part of the Harley-Davidson 110th Anniversary Concert Series in Milwaukee on August 30. In the fall of 2013, Aerosmith extended their tour to Central and South America, including their first-ever performances in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Uruguay. Hamilton had to depart the Latin American tour due to illness. In July 2013, the band released the live concert DVD Rock for the Rising Sun, which also documented the band's 2011 tour of Japan. The release was also screened in select theaters in October 2013. Final Years, Possible 16th Studio Album, Solo Endeavors, and Farewell Tour, 2014 Present on March 21, 2014, in tweets released by Joe Perry, Joey Kramer, and Slash, it was announced that Aerosmith would be touring North America with Slash, along with Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators, in the summer of 2014. This followed a 17-date European tour that Aerosmith took from May 14 to July 2. The North American tour, known as the Let Rock Rule Tour, sent Aerosmith to 21 locations from July 10 to September 12. Asked in May 2014 if Aerosmith will release a 16th studio album anytime soon, bassist Tom Hamilton replied, I hope soon. But I really don't know what we are doing because we no longer have a record contract. We are finished with Columbia. So, there is nothing written in stone. We'll see what the fans want. In an interview with Rolling Stone about what the future holds, Joe Perry admitted that, I don't even know if making new albums makes sense anymore. Maybe we'll just release an EP every six months. I don't know what the future looks like. On October 7, 2014, Perry released his autobiography Rocks, My Life in and Out of Aerosmith, CO written by David Ritz. Perry promoted the book with a book signing tour that took him to 14 locations across the United States in the month of October. On February 26, 2015, Aerosmith premiered the film Aerosmith Rocks Dunnington in 300 movie theaters across North America. The concert video is from the band's 2014 performance at Download Festival at Dunnington Park in Leicestershire, England. The video is set to be released on DVD slash Blu-ray on September 4, 2015. On March 31, 2015, lead singer Steven Tyler stated that he was working on his first solo country album. On April 6, it was announced that Tyler signed a record deal with Scott Borchetta's Dot Records, a division of the Big Machine label group. On May 13, Tyler released the lead single, Love Is Your Name from his forthcoming solo debut album. He promoted the song on The Bobby Bones Show, I Heart Media, CBS This Morning, Entertainment Tonight, and The American Idol Season 14 Finale. On June 10, Aerosmith embarked on the Blue Army Tour, which sent the band to 17 North American locations through August 7, many of them in smaller venues and secondary markets that the band has either never performed in or hasn't performed in many years. The band also played a one-off show in Moscow on September 5. On the tour, the band played several lesser-known deep cuts. After the tour, Tyler completed work on his solo album, Weary All Somebody From Somewhere, which was released on July 15, 2016. Prior to the album's release, a second single, Red, White and You, was released in January 2016, followed by the third single, the title track, in June 2016. Meanwhile, Joe Perry has worked with Alice Cooper and Johnny Depp on the side project Hollywood Vampires, which released their eponymous debut album in September 2015 and performed at the 58th Grammy Awards on February 15, 2016.
Brad Whitford rejoined Derek St. Holmes for a handful of tour dates in November 2015 and a new Whitford slash St. Holmes album that was made available to fans at their live performances and which is planned for wide release in 2016. Tom Hamilton will be performing with Thin Lizzy on a handful of concert dates in Europe in the summer of 2016. Tyler, Perry, Whitford, and Hamilton will all be on the road performing concerts in the summer of 2016 with their respective side projects. Meanwhile, Joey Kramer has been actively involved in his Rockin' and Roastin' Coffee business, which opened a location in Newry, Maine in December 2015 and a second location in North Attleboro, Massachusetts in July 2016. Since December 2015, in various interviews, Whitford, Tyler, and Perry all discussed the possibility of a farewell tour or wind down tour slated to start in 2017. Perry has suggested the tour could last for two years and Tyler said it could potentially last forever. Whitford and Tyler also discussed the potential of doing one last studio album. On July 10, 2016, Perry collapsed on stage at a concert he was performing with the Hollywood Vampires on Coney Island in Brooklyn. New York. It is believed he suffered cardiac arrest, was revived, and rushed to the hospital, but was quickly upgraded to stable condition later that night. The vampires continued the show without Perry that evening and will continue their tour, but cancelled an appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Perry is resting and expected to make a full recovery, he is expected to return on stage soon. From September through October 2016 Aerosmith embarked on a 10-day tour of Latin America preceded by a September 16 performance at the Cahaba Festival in San Diego, California. In November 2016, Aerosmith announced that they would be going on a farewell tour in Europe in the spring of 2017, titled The Aerovidersi Baby Tour. According to Brad Whitford, the tour could end any time from 2017 to the next five years in 2021. Influence and Legacy Influenced by bands such as The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, The Yardbirds, Led Zeppelin, and The New York Dolls Aerosmith proved to be a major influence themselves on subsequently massively successful bands and musicians, according to Perry. Eddie Van Hollen once told him that his band Van Hollen started out on the suburban LA club circuit, playing Aerosmith songs. Aerosmith's influence was evident on the next generation of hard rock and heavy metal bands Mealy Motley Crue, Rat, Guns N' Roses, Tesla, L.A. Guns, Cinderella, Faster Pussycat, Skid Row, Extreme, Warrant, The Black Crows, and The Choir Boys, as well as Metallica, Metal Church, and Testament. Especially, Guns N' Roses and Velvet Revolver guitarist Slash has stated that Aerosmith is his favorite band, and Motley Crue's Nicky Sills has expressed massive admiration for the band and its early records in both The Dirt and The Heroin Diaries. Members of Nirvana Mother Love Bone Slash Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, Stained and Godsmack are also self-professed early Aerosmith fans. The interplay between Joe Perry and Brad Whitford has been inspiring to many bands, especially Guns N' Roses. Joe Perry has received wide recognition and praise as a lead guitarist, and has shared the stage many times with Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck, who Perry cites as primary influences. He and Tyler were asked by Page to induct Led Zeppelin into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, during the ceremony, which took place in 1995, Tyler and Perry delivered their speech and joined the band on stage for a brief set. During Beck's and Metallica's induction in 2009, they invited Perry and Page to play the Yardbirds slash Zeppelin slash Aerosmith classic Train Kept A Rollin. Other collaborations, either by individual members of the band or by Aerosmith as a whole, have included Alice Cooper on his trash album, Guns N' Roses, who opened for Aerosmith during their 1988 tour and had covered Mama Kin on their first release, and BZ. As a testimony to their importance in American popular culture as a whole, Aerosmith have also collaborated with popular non-rock artists, such as Run DMC, Eminem, Sing for the Moment, and Carrie Underwood, and performed with NSYNC, Britney Spears, Mary J. Bleach, and Nelly for the Super Bowl 35. Halftime show. Entry artists Garth Brooks and Mark Chestnut both scored hit singles with covers of Aerosmith songs 
Brooks in 1995 with The Fever, a reworking of Aerosmith's 1993 song, and Chestnut in 1999 with a cover of Aerosmith's 1998 song I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Like many of their 1970s contemporaries including Led Zeppelin and Alice Cooper, the members of Aerosmith were prone to excess and debauchery. Drug consumption was rampant, the recording sessions for 1970's IXS Rocks and 1977's Draw the Line were especially noted for their substance indulgence, including heroin. In the words of Bebe Buell, the Aerosmith were like a gang of kids with their own planes, Porsches, millions of dollars, limitless resources. Mick Jagger and Jimmy Page had control, but these boys did not care. They won the prize, hands down, for the rowdiest rock and roll band in that era. No question. In the mid to late 1970s, the band enjoyed tremendous popularity in the United States and in Japan though they failed to make a big impression in Britain. Still, they were among the most popular hard rock acts in America in the late 1970s, along with Heart, Kiss, Ted Nugent, ZZ Top, and Boston. Their massive popularity waned, however, following Joe Perry and Brad Whitford's departures. Following both guitarists' return to the band and its complete drug cleanup, Aerosmith made a prodigious return to success once described as the single most successful comeback in the history of heavy metal, if not all of popular music. During both the 1970s and the 1987-1995 era, Aerosmith undertook grueling world tours that numbered in the triple digits numbers of dates, headlining or CO headlining festivals along the way, such as the Texas Jam in 1978 and 1987, the Monsters of Rock Festival at Castle Dunnington in 1990 and 1994, and Woodstock 94. Initially resistant to this medium, the band later became renowned and received numerous awards for pioneering expansive, conceptual music videos, such as those for Janie's Got a Gun, directed by future Fight Club director David Fincher, Livin' on the Edge, Cryin', Amazing, Crazy, Falling in Love, Is Hard on the Knees, and Pink. The band's music has also been featured in several video games, such as episodes of the Dead or Alive and Grand Theft Auto series, and some video games are centered on the band, like Quest for Fame and Revolution X. Aerosmith was the first band to have its band-centered Guitar Hero title, Guitar Hero, Aerosmith, which is considered to be the best-selling band-centric video game across both the Guitar Hero and Rock Band platforms. Awards and Achievements Despite Aerosmith's popularity and success in the 1970s, it wasn't until their comeback in the late 1980s and 1990s when they started winning awards and major recognition. In 1987, Aerosmith won the Soul Train Music Award for Best Rap Single for the remix of Walk This Way with Run D.M.C. In 1990, Aerosmith won their first Grammy Award for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal, and went on to win a total of four such awards, all of them in the 1990s, for Janie's Got a Gun, Livin' on the Edge, Crazy, and Pink. Aerosmith is second only to U2 in the number of awards won in that category. In addition, Aerosmith's music videos won numerous awards throughout the 1990s. Aerosmith ranks as the ninth most successful artist, and the third most successful group, of all time at the MTV Video Music Awards, VMAs, with 10 such awards to date. Aerosmith is also the all-time leader in the category's Best Rock Video, with four such awards, and Viewer's Choice, with three such awards. Aerosmith has also won once each in the category's Video of the Year, Best Group Video, and Best Video from a Film. The videos for which Aerosmith has won VMAs are Janie's Got a Gun, two awards, The Other Side, Livin' on the Edge, Cryin', three awards, Falling in Love, Is Hard on the Knees, Pink, and I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Over the course of their career, primarily 1990 and after, Aerosmith has also collected six American Music Awards, four Billboard Music Awards, two People's Choice Awards, 16 Boston Music Awards, and numerous other awards and honors. Some of the high accolades Aerosmith have achieved include induction into Hollywood's Rock Walk in 1990, 
a declaration of Aerosmith Day in the state of Massachusetts by then-Governor William Weld on April 13, 1993, induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001 and being honored with the MTV ICON Award in 2002. In the fields of technology and video games, Aerosmith has achieved several feats. In 1994, Aerosmith released the song Head First on the CompuServe online service, which is considered to be the first full-length commercial product available online. In 2008, Aerosmith became the first artist to have an entire Guitar Hero video game based around them with Guitar Hero, Aerosmith. Guitar Hero, Aerosmith is considered to be the best-selling band-centric video game across both the Guitar Hero and Rock Band platforms. Aerosmith also holds several chart and album sales feats, including the second highest number of number one singles on the mainstream rock tracks chart for a group with nine, the only number one debut on the Billboard Hot 100 by a rock group with I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, the most gold albums by an American group, the most total certifications, including gold, platinum and multi-platinum combined, by an American group, and are tied with Van Halen for the most multi-platinum albums by an American group. From the Recording Industry Association of America, Aerosmith has achieved 25 gold, 18 platinum and 12 multi-platinum album certifications, in addition to one diamond album, four gold singles, and one platinum digital single. Media often refer to Aerosmith, who have sold more than 150 million albums worldwide and 70.2 million in the United States, as the best-selling American rock band. Filmography and Videography In addition to recording and performing music, Aerosmith has also been involved with films, television, video games, and music videos. In 1978, the band starred as the future villain band in the film SGT Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Later, when the band resurrected itself in the late 1980s and 1990s, Aerosmith made further appearances, including the Wayne's World sketch on Saturday Night Live in 1990, the Flaming Moe's episode of The Simpsons in 1991, and the film Wayne's World 2 in 1993. The band has also been featured in the 2005 hit comedy Be Cool, starring John Travolta, Uma Thurman, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Cedric the Entertainer and Vince Vaughn. Steven Tyler plays a major role, helping Chili Palmer, Travolta, and Edie Athens, Thurman, bring pop music star Linda Moon, Christina Million, into the limelight. The band has been the subject of several video games including Revolution X in 1994, Quest for Fame in 1995, and Guitar Hero, Aerosmith, in June 2008. The band has also made over 30 major music videos, and released 7 home videos or DVDs.